How do you approach a game like that where your offense generates a lot of yards and looks fairly good most of the time but can't quite get in the end zone? I, I think, you know, kind of as you said, I think we approach it exactly what happened. I think that's true in every game. It's, hey, here are the things we did well that put us in position. Here are the things that we could have done better that would have probably got us over the top. And from a coaching standpoint, a playing standpoint, these are the things we need to improve. I think, you know, that's the mindset we come in here with every week at win or loss. And it certainly didn't change after the Sunday. For an offense that was so successful, so consistently in the red zone, goal to go specifically, the last couple of weeks, have you seen anything that's been more of a challenge maybe than it was earlier in the season? No, I think every game comes up differently, depending on who you're playing, what they do down there, what we need to take advantage of, things like that. You know, So I, I really do think it's a week-to-week -week thing as you get into the red zone. Obviously, this week the penalties were a huge factor down there. Was there anything else that you were seeing consistently that you guys weren't doing as well once you got down into that area? No, I think you hit on it. When you put yourself behind the sticks, really anywhere on the field, but certainly in a shorter area of the field, I think it makes it hard. What can you do to preventing pre-snap penalties? Or is impossible, but like, what can you do to help these guys limit their movement pre-snap? Is there anything you can do? In terms of eliminating the false starts? I think there's a number. Of, I mean, one, practicing with the crowd noise to try to put them in that environment to prepare them for the noise. And, and it, communication's an issue. I mean, that's, that's always going to be an issue on the road in an environment like that. Um, you know, I think the other thing is honing them in on the game plan. You know, the less they're thinking at the line of scrimmage, the less, the more confident we can make them in what they're doing and why they're doing it, the less they have to think about those things and they can lock in on the snap count, getting off on the right cadence, things like that. Um, I think those are probably the two biggest things that we try to do. Like, I think Tip had two, maybe three false starts. Is that kind of what you attribute that to? He's thinking a little bit too much? He would answer, again, better than me. Uh, you know, it's probably combination things. You know, it's, they do a lot of things on defense, too, that make you think. You know, that, that's real with a scheme like that. You do think that the noise play, played a factor there? On the sure. Night? Yeah, anytime you're in that environment, the fact in terms of what cadences you're going on, communication's harder, calling plays harder, getting in and out of the huddles harder. Uh, that's the nature of playing on the road in the NFL. So, is it, so are you glad to have those two road games behind you? Always prefer to be at home, you know, in front of our fans. It's, a, it's really excited to get back in that building. Not just with Marvin specifically, bigger picture, when you've got a rookie receiver, is truly the best way for them to get comfortable of meshing the physical and the mental side of things while producing the way you need them to, to just simply not only get reps, but continue to target them? Or yeah. Or is that, I'm trying to phrase this, of targeting him a lot, is that truly the best way to help a rookie receiver grow that first year? Yeah, and honestly, my thought process in game is not, hey, how do we help this guy grow? It's what are we going to do that gives us the best opportunity to win the game? He's one of our best players, so he's going to get targets. He's going to be involved in the passing game in a major way. Um, he's produced at a pretty high level, in my opinion. So I think it's more of a factor of that than necessarily like, hey, this is how he's going to grow. I trust him to grow because of the type of person he is, the type of teammate, the type of player he is, uh, regardless of what happens in or out of a game. Zay Jones was able to draw that, that DPI down the field. But the ball hasn't really been able to find him much since he got off suspension. What is his role within this offense? I think it changes week to week, depending on what personnel we feel like we need to be effective in that game, how we want to attack a defense. You know, it's always the issue when you have a number of guys that want and deserve the ball of trying to, you know, divvy up the piece of the pie. Certainly have some guys uh, on the offense in front of him that deserve targets. Um, but I'm really pleased with kind of the effort and energy he's playing with. You know, even when he's not necessarily getting all those targets, I think he's been able to affect the game. You know, he drew the PI in the red zone in the Jets game as well. Uh, you know, some of those plays have been really big for us. Back to Mark for a sec. How would you evaluate him thus far? I think he's doing a really nice job. You know, I think he's the type of person, like we talk about with some other guys, that he's hell-bent on getting better every day. And I think you see that progression and that understanding and that production, which has been great. Doesn't mean that every week's going to be, you know, 100 yards. Doesn't mean that every week's going to be 20. It's, it's always going to be based on the game plan, how I call it, what it looks like when it goes out there live. But I, I think you see him getting more and more comfortable playing with more confidence, making plays uh, in our offense, which has been great. And, and from a teammate standpoint and effort standpoint, which is really what we focus on as coaches, you know, he's been un unbelievable. He catches, uh, he catches five to 12 targets. How did the Vikings kind of disrupt that connection consistently through the game? I think there's a mix of coverages in terms of what they're doing. You know, some of that's the balls getting to them late because they're pressure on the quarterback and he had to step move around. I think there's a lot of factors that played into that. Oh, on, that first target, on that first target, well, I guess he was coming back to it and the ball kind of sailed by him. Uh, it was a comeback. He, he turned to his left. It looked like maybe 32. he should have turned to his right. Thirty-two. Oh, First, you know, I, I think that, you know, again, that was... Uh, did he run the right route there? What would happen on that? Yeah, point? yeah. I, I think it was, a, you know, he, he ran the right route. I think Kyler was trying to be safe with the ball based on what the underneath coverage was and probably put it a little wider than he wanted to. And, you know, certainly maybe, you know, 
just kind of, you know, th that's the nature of that game. It's, you know, a, a yard here or there, and that's a completion and a first down, and in that case it wasn't. Coming into the, into the season, did you have – what was going to be your criteria for a successful season for Mark? Was it your benchmarks? Did you – was it more kind of philosophical? Like yeah, I think it's more philosophical. I, I think no, at no point on anyone on our roster I'm saying, I need this type of production, this type – it's always – are they doing the job we're asking them to do to help us win games? I think that's the most important thing that everybody that comes into this building is about. Certainly from a coaching standpoint, what we ask the players to do, uh, I think he's done a really nice job of that. There's also always going to be areas where I'm saying, hey, we want to improve this. We want to get better there. We want to keep playing at a high level in these three areas. Um, so that's kind of how we approach it, if that makes sense. It's never a black and white of here's what success looks like, here's what it doesn't. I know you've talked a lot about everything's game to game with McBride. Um, he does seem to be on a little bit of a heater in terms of number of receptions. Is it what the defenses are doing? Or you, did you guys kind of shift at all at any point to like look for him more? No, I, I no, I don't feel that way. Um, I think it's kind of what you said. I think it's it's what the defense are doing and where the ball ends up going. I think when you, you know, as we talked about with Marv, with him, when you have players of that caliber, they're always going to be at the forefront of your mind when you design the offense, design the passing game. And so if they're constantly one, two, or three in the progression. Some games are going to get a lot of targets and a lot of touches. Some games are going to get, you know, three to four and make big plays. Other games, depending on what the coverage is, it might not go there. Um, but generally, he's at the forefront in our mind of everything we do in the passing game. And I think his production is just a, a factor of what's been consistent over the last couple weeks. What, what are you are teams paying Trey the proper amount of attention? Have you noticed? Are they – like in Seattle, we saw, like he was like wide open a whole bunch. Like, are they giving him – I don't want to say respect, but like the attention that they that he should be getting. I, I think so. I mean, again, like that would be like probably a question for Mike McDonald <laughs> um, more than me. But yeah, I think they're very. I mean, I don't think it's a surprise I me mean, based on how he ended last year, how he's played this year in our offense, that he's a huge part of our passing game. Um, you know, it's some, to get wide open. Sometimes he's winning versus man. Sometimes people play big zone, and we're able to affect coverage in different ways to to get him the ball. Uh, I think so many different factors play into that. But yeah, you know, I, I think people are very aware of who he is and how he produces. As a play caller, what can you do differently with him than an average tight end? Oh. I mean, honestly, I think it's kind of what we like. He's the focal. Like, if you had an average tight end in that role, it just wouldn't be the focal point of what you're doing necessarily. You would try to push the ball in other directions, get the ball to other people. But because of his skill set, because of how dynamic he is, he is going to be a person that's so uh, at the top of our list in terms of hey, here's how we design the passing game. We need to make sure that he's involved in the process. What, what is the overall challenge as a play caller in in the red zone? And I know it's probably a little bit different when you're between the ten and the twenty or inside the ten. I know it's a challenge because obviously it's like you pointed out, it's a short area of the field. Yeah, I, I think that's the biggest thing. You know, we when we talk about the red zone and run and pass game. You know, in the run game, all of a sudden the safeties are a lot closer to the line of scrimmage than they are when they're out there at the 50-yard line. So it's harder to block everybody in the run game. In the passing game, you can't just run away from people very often. So you have to find other ways to affect coverage. You know, we talk a lot about in the red zone, things are dirty, contested catches jump balls, uh, you know, heavy pressure you see a lot down there at times. So handle and protection becomes really important. Um, but it's, it's the nature of why it, it is so hard down there and why people spend so much time on it. With your success in goal-to-go situations until this, these past two weeks, obviously this is an offense that really emphasizes the stressing teams between running and passing with your multiple tight ends. Do you think that that helps you at the goal line? I do. I absolutely do. I think, you know, the, again, that hard part is you can't stretch the field necessarily in the action game, which you can do in the field to create some space. But I think that dynamic of are you going to, uh, you know, attribute the extra hats to the run game? Are you going to allow that to be there for Kyler if he pulls the ball or rolls out? Or are you putting those people in coverage? I think is very real. How was, how was it this week where here you are playing the Seahawks again? It seems like well, it was only two games ago. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen at least. So what, what is the specific challenge of that? Uh, it's a little unique, although it's funny, like this is such a week to week league. At, at one time in Cleveland, we actually played Baltimore two games in a row. We went Baltimore by week Baltimore. So it is something I have a little bit of experience with having done. And I think Mike was might even have been there. Um, I'm trying to think if that was the year he was at Michigan. But regardless, it, it doesn't happen often, but it's happened. I've been through it. And, and I do think it's kind of just a, hey, start from scratch. Look at the tape you have to evaluate what's been done, what you think is going to get done, how you need to be effective as an offense, and, and kind of repeat the process. I don't think a ton changes, even though you may have played them recently. What did you learn about the battle of the trenches two weeks ago against Seattle for this offensive line this week? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's so much learned as kind of confirm what we thought. Like, I remember talking in here before we played them, like, that front is what makes their defense go. It's a really dynamic front. They got some really talented players. You know, certainly we have to handle that and be ready for that, as we knew walking into the first game. Um, so I don't think it changes that, but it, it certainly confirmed what we thought prior to walking into that game. Does it ramp up the urgency because of 
and obviously the, the whole front's pretty good, but obviously Williams was, as Jonathan called him, a game wrecker. Does that ramp up the urgency knowing that can't let that happen again? Yeah, certainly. Uh, we went into that game knowing we couldn't let it happen that game, if that makes sense. You know, it's funny, like people have talked about, hey, he's gotten going these last couple of weeks. He's been he might not always be on the stat sheet, but he's been wrecking games since he walked into the NFL. Uh, that's been his MO. He's a great player. So uh, I don't see that mindset or our awareness of that changing going into this week. On James's contract extension, I guess twofold of one, what was your initial reaction or response to him? And two, given what this offense likes to use and how you like to call the game, I mean, could you truly draw maybe a, a better starting running back from the person and character than what he gives you? You know, I'll go with the second one first. Cert no. I mean, he, he's everything you would want in a premier tailback. Just, uh, you know, as a player, the effort he runs with, the violence, the way that he carries himself. I mean, he, and, and, you know, we don't play him a ton in all downs. You know, obviously you can't play a guy 60, 75 snaps a game at running back, but he's a great protector. He's really good in pass protection. He takes a lot of pride in it. Uh, you know, I could stand up here and talk about him for hours. I mean, he does so many things well. And then as a teammate, as a leader in the locker room, you know, I, I can't say enough about that. So when any time a guy gets a contract like that, I don't, you know, I'm not going to make a big deal of it. I you know, certainly congratulate him. He earned it, you know, very happy for him. That's a big deal. Um, but, you know, from my relationship and how we interact, it doesn't change a lot. It's more of a, hey, man, like, congrats. You earned it. Really, really excited for you. Really proud of you. Um, just keep doing what you're doing. And, and, and that's what he's about. So it's been, I was, I was fired up to see it. You guys played, like I say, a place of trust in, I think, on one series. What went into that? Was that planned? Was that? Uh, I think it was more than one. Might have just been one. It's kind of the rotation that we've been using over the course of the year, kind of in and out of. And, you know, as we talked about, you know, in this room, we're always going to do what we feel like is best to win each game. So sometimes that's a rotation at different positions in a certain way. Sometimes it's not. Uh, but it was nothing more than that. Back to back weeks, Michael Wilson's made ridiculous catches. Is that just his football instinct, or is that? I mean, I'm sure you're not practicing acrobatic catches. Uh, but how much of that is his football instinct versus just what you guys put out throughout the week? Uh, the acrobatic catches are football instinct and ability. You know, that, that's certainly him. And it is something I do think that you work on. Like, you, you know, it's not like we're designing full 11-on-11 11 11 plays. Like, hey, make this unbelievable catch here when we could put it on your face mask on the move. But I think in individual drills, in between, you know, downtime before practice, you do work on body position, catching outside your frame, making some of those impressive catches that, that make highlight reels. And, and certainly he's really good at that. And I think a lot of it's concentration. You know, that's probably the biggest thing at the receiver position. You got a lot of other things going on, balls bouncing around and staying, you know, staying focused, which is certainly something you talk about and work throughout the week. One more on the red zone. It, is that a concern for you when, it, when a game goes like that, or, or are you confident that this week will be different and that was an aberration? Uh, I, I think a combination. I mean, certainly you're concerned that it happened. You know, so you got to do a good deep dive in terms of, hey, what was the issue? Is it something systematic? Is it my play calling? Is it scheme? Is it who we're highlighting? Is it something they did on defense? Uh, you have to try to identify those things. But I'm also, to like, am I panicked? No. I mean, you know, we were really good in the red zone for a reason. We weren't really good for the last two weeks. We got to get back to doing some of the things we did in the past, whether it's execution, scheme, all those different things. Um, I think it's a combination. And it's fair to say that analysis started with the penalties? Yeah, I think certainly, in, you know, if you look at what we did in the red zone last week, the penalties were a big part of it, absolutely. I mean, illegal man downfield play, was that just Kyler improv after the run? Yeah, a little bit of him, you know, certainly called a play, it wasn't there. He's going to play off schedule. Those things happen. You got to live with that.